Welcome to Opera San Jose Talks. Today we are here to discuss Richard Wagner's opera The Flying Dutchman, and I have with me Carrie Ann Otano, who is singing Senta, and Noel Boulet, who sings The Dutchman himself. Welcome, Carrie Ann and Noel. Thank you. We open Dutchman on February 10, just two weeks away, and after music rehearsals that ran the first week of January and 18 days of staging rehearsals, we're preparing to go to the California Theater for music, technical, and dress rehearsals, and we are now putting everything together step by step, rehearsals with singers and orchestra, rehearsals on the scenery with props, costumes, makeup, lighting, and for Dutchman projections. This is the time when our individual preparation gets combined and we discover how well the puzzle parts fit together. So welcome you two. And uh, Carrie Ann and Noel, both of you are having your company debuts. We are. Yep. So, <laughs> and I'll never forget your auditions. <laughs> how lucky was I to be in New York and have the two of you come in and sing. <laughs> and, uh, and you kept telling us, telling us how your husband was so much more talented than you and he's in our president company yeah. now. <laughs> But I always thought you were very, very talented, my oh, dear. <laughs> really <laughs> wonderful singing. And uh, to have everybody here on stage in rehearsals. And I have to, just the luckiest job, right? Because if I get bored with typing or studying <laughs> finance reports, I could just get up from my desk and walk into a rehearsal hall. <laughs> and there's going to be something going on there, right? Yeah. And it's such a joy. And I've really enjoyed also the covers. Mm -hmm. oh, it's been, uh, I was at the cover run through on Saturday. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, they're they're stepping up. Phenomenal. Yeah, they're stepping up. Yeah, I have to say I've I've been part of a lot of productions that had covers, and I've been covering in a lot of productions. And rarely have I seen a cover cast that has been, you know, given so much preparation and so much attention that uh, that I think the company, you know, if something, God forbid, were to happen, they would feel very comfortable. They could walk on, knowing mm -hmm. that they have mm -hmm. a second cast of world class singers ready Absolutely. to go. Well, the deal is. I can't hire a lot of stage directors in America because they will not work with the cover. Oh, wow. <laughs> well. They don't even understand the concept. Yeah. And they get a performance. Mm -hmm. All the covers go out and perform with orchestra in front of an audience together. Mm. Yes. You know, Larry, that will never happen. The entire <laughs> cast will not grow ill at once. <laughs> that will never happen. Yeah. I said, well, it's the only way I can be absolutely personally certain mm -hmm. that no matter who is ill, the person standing in has sung the role in public with the orchestra and the conductor. Absolutely. And that matters to me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I do know that in this country, many regional companies of our size and bigger don't engage covers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Don't even hire them. Mm -hmm. And I got the great shock of my life when I called up an opera company. We were going to do Anna Karenina. Mm. And we were going to build a new physical production, but we wanted to use those orig the original costumes. They were very beautiful. And so I called up and said, hi, we'd like to rent your Anna Karenina costumes. They said, oh, great, we were talking about it. And I said, and I'll need both sets. And he said, both sets, what do you mean? I said, well, the covers <laughs> and the principles, because we were going to double cast. Mm. And he said, we didn't hire any covers. <laughs> I said, oh, thank you. Well, I'll get back to you, because yeah. now I need to talk to the designer, because we're going to have to build a second set, right? Mm -hmm. But I hung up the phone, and I thought, there was one woman on the planet who could sing the title role. Mm. What happens when she breaks her ankle? Sure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Sure. Anybody could have an accident on the stairs in the theater. Mm -hmm. Anything could happen. You could be hit by a truck, no fault of your own, mm -hmm. and not be able to go on stage. You refund everybody? Right. I mean, nothing happened to them. God bless them. Mm -hmm. Nothing well, happened to them. When I was at Washington National Opera during the ring cycle, the Brunhilde had a big jump off the table. Mm. Um, and in the final dress rehearsal, just rolled her ankle as she was landing. Mm -hmm. um, and fortunately, like everything was, everything was uh, had covers for that. So the Helmviga went on for Brunhilde, and I went on for Helmviga, but we didn't have costumes. So as soon as I get out there, I sing my first high C, split my pants right open because oh. I was wearing the girls' clothes that were way too small for me. Oh, no. But I was like, no one cares. Just hold the note, girl. Yeah. Just sing. Yeah. <laughs> That's how it's done, isn't yeah. it? You can't worry about those things Don't now. Don't worry about these pants. <laughs> that high C, pants. that's what matters right now. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> So we live in a, we work in a crazy business. Yeah, <laughs> I think absolutely. we should be knocking on wood right now. Oh my God, yeah, we're talking about it so much. <laughs> well, 
we do really try here. I mean, we're a tiny little company. We all get that. You, mm-hmm. you know our fees are low. Everything about this company is on the, on the cheap side. And <laughs> if we could do it for less, we did it for less. Um, but on the, on the flip side, on what gets on the stage, we lavish more money mm-hmm. than a whole lot of companies do mm-hmm. who, are, who are bigger than we are. Mm-hmm. Sure. Uh, the kind of set design, the kind of costume design, all those kind of things, we do invest there. And of course, we invest in singers. Mm-hmm. Uh, we just don't pay the same fees as everybody else, so we kind of are, are the second choice. <laughs> <laughs> but we're, we've had such great luck for the past three years, and now going almost, we're halfway through the fourth year mm-hmm. uh, since I started running the company and changed the focus of the company. The company used to be focused on singers. That was the focus. Irene Dallas was an opera singer. She started out here in San Jose, California, and discovered she had this voice when she went to graduate school in New York and then got a Fulbright and the next thing she knew she was singing at Oldenburg in Berlin. Mm-hmm. Uh, and she was at Oldenburg for two years, Berlin for two years, and then went on stage at the Met as Eboli. Mm. So her first role in her life was Eboli in Oldenburg. So and the next thing she knew she was never the first choice. <laughs> she was the second choice. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But for both German and Italian rep. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Where the first choice is Christa Ludwig, didn't sing in Italian. <laughs> and the, the gal who was the hot mezzo for Italian rep didn't sing German. Mm-hmm. So, but Irene sang both, and very happily, and it was comfortable in lots of things. Mm-hmm. As a, American singers are trained to differently. Mm-hmm. We do have to be comfortable in just about everybody's language. Right. Mm-hmm. And foreign singers don't. I mean, when Domingo sings in English, you kind of think, why don't you sing that in Spanish? Yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Yeah, and he's a he's a god, right? I mean, mm-hmm. I mean maybe even immortal. <laughs> I wonder if he was trying to get around the Cape of Good Hope. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I, I, the original, yeah. The original. So let, let's uh, let's get you two introduced. So Noel, yes, you're from Texas. Yes, I am. And you have a father and mother who are artists. Your mother is a visual artist. Right. And your father is a choral conductor. Right, yeah. I, See, every, I learned this earlier. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're having a little recap here. Right. Yeah. So, but, uh, yeah, everyone in my family, uh, except for my mother, who is a visual artist, are choral conductors. And my grandfather was um, a big, influential choral conductor in Texas and across the nation, actually. And um, and then his his other daughter and my father were his students, and along with many many of the previous generation choral conductors in Texas, and they they have created this really strong choral uh, choral tradition in Texas, and um, so I grew up with that, and I sang in choirs and um, uh, you know. Uh, musical productions and and uh, did solos and competitions and things like that and um, kind of separated from my family a little bit in the fact that they preferred to be uh, directing or in the choir and I preferred to be out in front of all of them singing the solos. <laughs> so uh, I, I actually went to uh, college and majored in choral conducting and eventually doubled in performance and then enjoyed that so much and started. What did you go successful. to grad school? I went to grad school at Cincinnati Conservatory. Oh, good. That's a good yeah. school. Yeah. And I stayed there for a couple more years and did an artist diploma. And like everybody in America, you know, kind of did as many degrees <laughs> as I, and young artist <laughs> programs as I had to until sure. the career took over. So, uh, yeah. And then shortly after that, moved to Germany. And that's where my career really began to pick up. And I try to come back to America as much as I can. I typically come back once or twice a year for or a season for something, concert or opera or something. And because this I mean this is this is home and this is where I really love to perform. Uh, although I also love performing in in Europe, but it's just different. <laughs> Noel, you're married, right? I am. And where's your wife? My wife is here with me in San Jose. Cool. Yeah, she um She's also a singer, uh, but she was able to, she, her family lives in the uh, Los Angeles area. And so I said, I got a gig in California. And she said, I'm coming with you. So great. Uh, she was down in, in LA for a while, um, but now she came up here and she brought our daughter, who is a um, full bred uh, French bulldog. 
<laughs> you had uh, me going there for a minute. Yeah, yeah. yeah. his full bread. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. She's she's great, and um, uh, and we're enjoying San Jose. And we went to the beach yesterday, and not you know I and I all of my friends and colleagues in Berlin are hating me <laughs> because I'm posting pictures at the beach and they're bundled up in a snowstorm. <laughs> Mm. Well, there it is. Yeah. Well, Carrie Ann, I know you're married also because I'm your not, husband works here. I'm engaged. You're engaged. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. We're we're big in wedding planning. Also, we've been together for so long. I, everybody thinks that we're married yeah. already. Yeah. Well, cool. It took we're me the longest time September. to learn how to say Dane. It's my dad still calls him Dan. It's fine. Well, I was we've been to... together for five years. My dad's like Dwayne. Oh. Dan, <laughs> Diane. It's not. Um, clo- it's wrong. It's getting worse. Dad. See, I thought it was Bill. I <laughs> I've been calling him Bill. <laughs> Me too. I often call him Bill. It's fine. <laughs> well, I was calling, introducing him as Dana. Oh it's no. Fine. Totally fine. A bit wah at the end. <laughs> <Dana>. <laughs> So, and he's a tenor. He is. And he's covering Eric. Uh-huh. And he'll be singing Alfredo uh, in April. Yes, he will. So that's that's exciting and fun. I'm thrilled. So, and here you are singing Santa. What do you do? What, are, you're just staying here for now, though, right? Because mm-hmm. you'll be traveling on after Dutchman is over. Yeah, the day after we close um, Dutchman, I go to Chicago, where I'm covering at the Lyric uh, in Fellow Travelers. All right. Mm-hmm. So I have I should go see that. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I just got back Apparently from Moby great. Dick in Salt Lake. Oh my gosh, I love that show. <laughs> I, I love so that show. So excited. Yeah. It's gonna be amazing. Yeah, it's gonna be amazing. Mm-hmm. I was so proud of that cast. Mm-hmm. I mean, I have nothing to do with them at all. I bought a ticket and walked inside, <laughs> right? But, but I would they sang so well, yeah. so well. And I the one one of their guys has often sung with us. Oh, fantastic. Um, but. Uh, it was. I was just really very impressed with everybody. I liked them all, and mm-hmm. it turns out that we've auditioned many of those singers. Yeah. And so I called up Corey and said, "Hire any one of them that you want." Oh, fantastic! Because they're all supreme. Mm-hmm. Everybody was wonderful. Mm-hmm. And what a great new set that is. Uh, that that's really you know it's quite uh, sailor suits or sailor suits, right? I mean. Right. <laughs> uh, but that set is really quite wonderful. Uh, construction is a little bit like our Dutchman set mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, in that it's a complete wraparound. Love that. Uh, I was at the theater this morning, and I've never seen side walls this tall. I'm so mm. excited. These side walls, are, these side walls are, must be 25 feet high, mm-hmm. <laughs> and the back wall is probably higher yet, mm-hmm. and it's all just solid wood. Wow. Mm-hmm. So when you sing on that stage on a rake, yeah. mm-hmm. it's just going <laughs> to pop out into the room. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You're going to have no trouble with this. There's no competition here. It's just all going to just fly out into the room, and everybody's going to want earplugs because <laughs> it's going to be good. Uh, I love, I, I do really love our set. I, 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 I can't wait for the first tech rehearsal so I can see how this is going to work. Of course, Brad doesn't really actually get through very much at a tech rehearsal. <laughs> He, he reconsiders every decision he has already made. Sure, uh, sure. He, he goes back again and says, was that really the best way? And he keeps tweaking and tweaking. And then when you finally get a true honest to God run through on the fourth tech. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. You guys will probably get one on the third tech. Yeah. <laughs> you guys will get, because the covers, they will get a fourth, they'll uh-huh. get the fourth tech. Yeah. Uh, but that's when he finally settles down and says, okay, well, we can't go back and change much. That's when the orchestra arrives. Right. And then we're on the clock, and so mm-hmm. you can't be fiddling around. Mm-hmm. So the thing about Flying Dutchman for me, I, let's talk about Wagner first. Um, one of the most complex minds ever to work in our field. One of the most conflict, he was not conflicted, I'm sure. <laughs> but those of us who try to enter into the world of Wagner since World War II, mm. we've had a whole different experience now. Mm-hmm. And to see the, the things that he espoused and the things that he held dear in his heart, mm-hmm. uh, the complete eradication of Jews from Germany, uh, that was a big deal for him. It was and he says it was integral to his very being. And uh, we don't understand it. It's hard for us because we, we, don't, we are not steeped in the philosophy that was coming forth at the time. Mm-hmm. And it was presumed that w- different races were enormously different. And now we've learned that, no, it's like 1% or 2% of genes are different from 
our various races, that mm -hmm. Homo sapiens is Homo sapiens everywhere it goes, and we're just the same thing. But they did not believe that. In this mm -hmm. country, they didn't believe it. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't allow Jews to escape Europe to come into the United States because they were terrified of mixing the blood mm. with uh, what, what they considered an inferior race. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was accepted all through Western culture. And, and we look at that in shock and horror, mm -hmm. but it was not horrifying then. Uh, our own government practiced these things, mm -hmm. and European governments practiced these things. And only when we saw how far it can go did we abandon that. So Wagner is of his time, and that's kind of tough on, on those of us who would like to listen to the Liebestod, mm -hmm. because that's, that's a big deal. Mm -hmm. um, but in singing, uh, the boss, Irene Dallas, who founded Opera San Jose, was a Wagnerian. She's, Kundry was one of her favorite roles, and Ortrud. Mm -hmm. She actually, she got applause at Bayreuth for Invita Goethe in the middle of an act there was applause at Byron, and she was never asked back. <laughs> so, oh well. <laughs> too much success is too much success. Yeah. Um, Americans just don't know how to do opera. Apparently. Right. Guess not. <laughs> yeah, well, she went out there and sold it. <laughs> and um, at any rate, so she sang a great deal of Wagner, and she and I talked about Wagner a lot. And what... What, the thing that rings in my head about those conversations is always the awe with which she discussed Wagner's setting of the text. Mm -hmm. She said, you never had to make a decision about what to sing or how to sing it. Mm -hmm. You just sing what he wrote. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to think about it. Just sing it. Mm -hmm. And it's done. And Irene would say herself, she was not an intellectual, she was not a person who wondered and pondered and tried. Mm -hmm. She instinctively grabbed a score and went for it, right? But she felt that Wagner gave you just everything. And, in, and, the, and what I've been doing now with my own research, uh, leading up to the talks that I have to give in front of the show, so do all those other singers. Mm. They say the same thing. Mm -hmm. You don't have to think of anything except singing exactly what he put on paper just how he wrote it down. Mm -hmm. Are you finding it that, so let's carry on. Are you finding it that satisfying also? It, does it help, do you have to, because this is early Wagner, okay? Mm -hmm. like this, this is, <laughs> so he may not have developed as far as he's going to go. <laughs> so what are you finding? Um, well, I, I just wanted to first circle back to the point that you made about uh, his sort of bad history. Um, and uh, especially right now with, with Me Too and you know all these movements going on now about exposing um, about exposing like a sexual misconduct and, and bad behavior yeah. from the church right on to the, exactly. to the Met. I, I think that it's important that we, uh, for me, from my perspective, the way that I've been looking at it across the board, because my parents are very Catholic and, and so that was another big, big scandal. Um, there's a way to appreciate the, the art that someone created without, uh, without endorsing them as a person. Um, we see it with, you know, people not turning their back on the, on the faith just because of what some bad people did. I think that we have the same situation with, you know, Bill Cosby and Woody Allen and Louis C.K. Um, people who make, um, who made amazing art and made amazing contributions and did some horrible things. And I think that we do ourselves a disservice by turning our back on the things that they created. Um, so it's the same with Wagner. I think that we, as an opera community would be at a disadvantage if we turned our back on his creations, oh, which are so important. The hole that would leave in, in music history to pull mm -hmm. Wagner right, out. Right, right. Uh, I think it's important that we talk about it and that we're aware of what he did and what yeah. he believed in, but the art that he created is a, a, a separate thing for me. It stands alone. Yeah. Absolutely, it stands. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and Noel said earlier today, uh, there are wonderful people who are lousy artists. Right, <laughs> <Okay>. right. <laughs> so my mother was a wonderful woman, but she couldn't cook. Yeah. <laughs> and she didn't know that. She thought she was a wonderful cook. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true, you know, I mean, uh, it's you, you, bad people with bad intentions sometimes create beautiful things. Mm -hmm. And, and you, you do have to separate those two things. It's nothing is simple. 
Right. And if it, in fact, simple things are often boring. Mm -hmm. So um, it's yes, we do need to pay attention to these things and pay attention to people's pasts and what they did. Um, but I, I agree 100%. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it would it would create a huge hole, just like you said. So, mm -hmm. and and then there is taking a thing of its own time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you, you can't say that. Uh, Plato and Aristotle were all yeah. wrong because yeah. of the era they lived in sure. and how mm -hmm. they lived their lives. Mm -hmm. sure. They were perfectly respectable in mm -hmm. their lives then mm -hmm. and trying to live up to a standard. Um, you, you can't, it just doesn't, it doesn't work right. to take your time and your ethics and your morals right. and try to apply those to other cultures, other places, other point. structures. Absolutely mm -hmm. not. And, and art, art almost always represents the current thoughts and beliefs of people and, and, and it, it passes just, very quickly here too yes mm -hmm. absolutely mm -hmm. and and just i mean the the music that is being created by our great artists today um is very representative of the of society's problems today i mean mm -hmm. we have we have pieces that um, represent transgender and um same-sex love and and everything all of the current issues Concerns, that we're dealing with right yeah. now and and Wagner did the same then you know he 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 wrote about his experience and the things that he knew and um it's not it, I, I had an argument with um a fellow artist one time and he he said uh, he of course he was German but he said there were absolutely n there was absolutely no evidence of Wagner's anti-semitism in his music and I said you have to be kidding me <laughs> There are obvious examples, but that doesn't mean that it's bad music, mm. and that doesn't mean that we should not perform it. Just mm -hmm. like, just like we have to study the um, horrible histories that came before us, and the things that they led to, and right. the revelations that they led to, mm -hmm. and so uh, you know. We could go on and on about we, this, but, we could. Yeah. but back, back to the Dutchman. <laughs> Human history goes back. I'm reading right now Sapiens. Yeah, I don't recommend it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't recommend it. <laughs> It'll make you just ashamed of yourself and not be able to eat eggs. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. it, it just it reminds me of that story. You know, The Giver, the where it's it's basically it's this dystopian story where people don't rem they don't remember history they don't remember mm. they're not told and one person carries all like sort of the memories but the way that it it strips the world of color and vibrancy it strips the world of appreciation for for all the great things if you're not aware of the terrible things if you're not if we try to sweep them under the rug and pretend everything is sunshine and rainbows then we don't appreciate when we really have sunshine and rainbows. Do you know yeah, what I mean? Of um, course, yes. So the darkness before the dawn. Right, mm -hmm. right. If, if all your life is this happiness, you mm -hmm. ain't got no life at all. Mm -hmm. Right, right, mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah. And speaking of which, I mean, you, you, you know, bringing it back to the Dutchman, this story, you can find an amazing message in this story. Um, regardless of Wagner's personal beliefs or his actions, the story that he wrote um, has an incredible message of compassion and redemption and sacrifice mm -hmm. and salvation. And it's, it's uh, it, you know, back to Wagner writing his own text and it going along hand in hand with the music that he wrote. Uh, I find that it is incredibly easy to interpret Wagner if you listen to the music as well. If you well. really are paying attention mm -hmm. to what yeah. you're doing. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, it, he wrote his own um, librettos and, uh, he used some language sometimes that is very difficult to follow and understand, but um, in the Dutchman, it, it's a little bit it's a little bit simpler. You know, it's it, he hasn't gotten quite um, I don't know how to say he hasn't he hasn't advanced too far yet. It's so convoluted. Yeah, well, he, was, and, he was only twenty nine. Right, and so <laughs> and so the story is I mean it is uh, simple and it is um, interesting, of course, but it. I think it, it, it creates um, exactly what you want it to on stage. I mean, mm -hmm. the, pic the pictures that he paints with the music and the text, you can just see it without having to see it. I mean, yeah. Wagner isn't going to have the money to be able to indulge in intellectual pursuits until after Dutchman. Sure. sure. Mm -hmm. So when he goes to Dresden mm -hmm. is when he's now going to have the opportunity to have sufficient money to line his bookcases 
with philosophy and mm. all the kinds of things that he did become very interested in Kant. He was a real believer mm. in Kant and Schopenhauer. I, I guess there's a little background. In the 18th century, everybody thought that mankind, humanism, you know, from the 16th century into the 18th century, humanism was the big thing, and it got bigger and bigger and bigger, and the church began to lose its grasp of mm -hmm. the most educated people, um, and the scientific method is a big, big deal. And the idea, I mean, it was Descartes, I guess, who, who described God as the clockmaker because he discovered, uh, he invented um, a, a form of geometry that lets you understand how things all work together. And he started seeing the universe as basically set in motion by a God. Mm -hmm. All these things were thought of and created by a God and it was all set in motion and God doesn't have to touch it anymore. It's in motion mm -hmm. and it will just run its course. And, the, and God was, was described as the divine clockmaker because mm -hmm. all of these rules of physics cause everything to happen and they're just going to happen right on and, mm -hmm. until he's decided the clock is run down or whatever. <laughs> um, but then we got a lot of bad things happening. The French Rev Revolution turned into a bloodletting that was seven years of, of horror. Uh, the, the Lisbon... Uh, earthquake and tsunami that wiped out the city of Lisbon and all of its churches and it was a giant mess. Uh, the whole of society, when we start getting into the 19th century, falls into a sense of great feeling of having been deluded mm -hmm. about how wonderful humankind is. And, and our forward progress and our ability to find everything out and fix everything through science. So it's going to be our savior. So Voltaire fell from grace and, and a lot of these guys who were creating the Enlightenment, they kind of fell from grace. And there was a sense of, we need to go back before then. We need to go to the Gothic. We need to go back to instinct and emotion and feeling and all this thinking is has done us no good. Mm. And now we have ugly factories everywhere. We have all this stuff going on in our society. Poverty like we have never seen before. Wealth like we have never seen before. People starving, children starving. And they started shipping, uh, England started shipping. Uh, they would just go into the ghettos where the poor lived who weren't finding work in these factories, but they'd been forced off the land by the wealthy who just took over all the land. And they sent them to Australia and to New England. And they called... Uh, the American, the North American continent was called the Great Sink. It was where they were dumping the refuse. Mm. Mm. That's where we get the phrase white trash, mm. waste people. And they just sent them over here, just get them out of England. Mm -hmm. So we don't have to worry with all these people who have no way to earn a living. Sure. Just get them over here. Uh, and there was just this great disheartening feeling that there's, what hope is there for mankind, except through, once again, there was a, a burst forth of faith, uh, a, a, a second, uh, what do they call it, a, a revival of faith in the United States, a giant one in the middle of the century, and it was true in other places too, and a turning away from science and a turning away from the, the possibility of progress and going back to the idea that it should just be stasis. We should just have this one thing. And suddenly all of our stories and all of our operas end in death, <laughs> and Shakespeare suddenly comes in vogue again mm. because that's brutal stuff, right? Mm. So suddenly Shakespeare is a big deal, and Wagner is just riding the wave of his own time. Mm -hmm. uh, as a, he's more hopeful mm -hmm. than most composers. Verdi just lets them all die. Right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. so it's a it, it's it is of its time, mm -hmm. and because we're so separated from its time, and our educational system doesn't bother much with history. Sure. I mean, even in it, I was, I was the generation that they started, they quit educating us. Uh, and that happened when I was in eighth grade and they pulled me out of my English class where we were diagramming sentences. It was the first two weeks of the eighth grade. And I got pulled out and sent to the advanced English class across the hall mm -hmm. where they were just taking us all out and they were forming this new class. And we were no longer taught parts of speech. We were no longer taught how grammar worked. And we were just given paragraphs that were beautifully written, mm -hmm. and we were asked to write like that. So we turned in work that was like that. Uh, and so I don't know the parts of speech. Right. I don't know a gerund from a hole in the ground. <laughs> uh, and um, it's a, it, they, and instead of teaching us civics, they taught us something called Problems in American Democracy. Mm -hmm. And the textbook was 
communism versus Americanism. Fantastic. And of course, Fantastic. the correct title would have been communism versus capitalism. Right. Yeah. But they no, didn't no, no, address no. capitalism. <laughs> no, they addressed <laughs> freedom and liberty you know, and mm-hmm. justice for all. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they don't have that over there. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we, they quit educating us. They started teaching us what they wanted us to think. Patriotism. Mm-hmm. Instead of teaching us history and mm-hmm. having an understanding of how it all worked. Because our history is not exactly blameless. Sure. Right? I mean, yeah. you, you don't have to look very far back mm-hmm. and you discover that people were being paid $5 a head for Native American heads that were turned in. The men were five bucks, here in California anyway, it was five bucks for a guy's head and 250 for a woman or a child. And you just brought the heads in. And then the white trash problem got to be a big deal all over and states literally discussed the idea of offering the same bounty for poor whites. Mm. Bring in their head and we'll give you this much money for just killing them off. That was serious debate in state legislatures all over the nation. It's like, yeah, read white trash. Mm-hmm. No, don't. I don't recommend you read that. No. <laughs> but aren't we stronger for knowing that? You I know? think, oh, I it, don't know. I think, I think that like this idea that, that this, this sort of whitewashing is the word I'm going to use, but it's maybe not the best word, but this whitewashing of, of history where we sort of pretend that everything's fine and that everything was great and it's it's more important to be truthful so that we don't repeat you know so that we know where we came from so we can know where we're going the truth will you know? set you free mm-hmm. yeah well, i've often uh, in the past about five years i've thought many times that i wear all these black t-shirts all the time it's kind of my uniform and i thought i'm going to have 1789 embroidered across the t- front of <laughs> all my black t-shirts just to remind people <laughs> That when the discrepancy between wealth and poverty gets Mm -hmm. so big, people do stand up and there are more of them than there are of you. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. (laughs) So pay attention Mm -hmm. unless you want us to gather you up and take you to Paris. Right. (laughs) (laughs) So who who knows? I mean, how to do this. The book that I'm reading now, The Sapiens, talks a lot about how we govern ourselves. Mm Mm-hmm. But it starts literally with the first sapiens. It goes back wow. to the first sapiens. Mm-hmm. And it takes you through the whole of it's religion, everything, every, how the government works. And right now I'm, I'm, I'm on a section called religions and I just finished capitalism. Mm-hmm. He's treating capitalism and communism and socialism as religions. Wow. Uh, because they function just like religions uh, that we would t- typically think of. Yeah. But we, we lump Buddhist in there. They don't talk about God. Mm-hmm. We look Confucianism there. They don't talk about God. Mm-hmm. Um, so he's dumping them all in the same pot that's interesting. and examining them in the same way. And of course, capitalism's where we are now, and that's what I quit reading today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but Mr. Wagner, I guess we're, we're just not talking about what we're supposed to talk about. <laughs> I can't keep us on target here. <laughs> um, well, you know, I, 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 to bring us back to it, I was thinking of yet another lesson that we can take from the Dutchman, and that is the acceptance of refugees. Mm-hmm. Because ah. the Dutchman himself is, yeah. is a wandering... Person he has no home. Persecuted and has no home. He has no homeland. And Dalant sent his father, says, do you think we could accept him into our home? Could we do that? Can you accept him? And if you like him, why don't you marry him? So, right. <laughs> I mean, it, it kind of fast forwards a bit, but there it is in a nutshell. You know, I mean, here's this person who has something to offer and we will accept him and make him one of us. Of course, he brought a great chest of gold. Well, there's, that doesn't Very hurt. Handy. Yeah, yeah. But Dolan sees past that. You know, he's a really, he's a people I person. I see past it. She so does Dolan too. Dolan sees yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Well, true. well, I don't know. I mean, Dolan does know. He said, even without the money, oh. I would want you for my, my son-in-law. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Of course, I think he's lying, but... Right. Money helps. <laughs> money Don't take the money away. Oh, was it Marilyn Monroe? <laughs> and, there was, and, and some like, no, it was in Gentlemen Prefer Blondes mm-hmm. when uh, she's being accused of only wanting to marry this guy for his money. And she said, my goodness, you wouldn't marry a girl just because she's pretty, but doesn't it help? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> now both of us are married or getting married to singers so I don't know that money is really that big of a, it no. wasn't big of a factor when we decided yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think I was I know I was I was 16 years old when I knew that I was not going to go down on the path toward money hmm. and it, I was the president of the Methodist Youth Fellowship mm. 
And I had to study these lessons, right? And, and have conversations around the lessons in this book, this publication that came to us once a month or something. And on the cover, it had all these people going to work in New York. It was a New York sidewalk, and everybody's walking in the same direction on this sidewalk. Somebody took a picture, and that was on the cover. And I can't remember what was inside the book, but I'll never forget that picture. <laughs> because when I saw it, I looked at all of their faces, and they all looked like they were going to the gas chamber. Mm. I mean, they all of them, they just had these dead faces. Mm -hmm. And I recognized that was my father's eyes sure. when he got up from the breakfast table. Mm. And dad was a jolly guy. Dad was funny. Uh, great personal confidence and uh, a real sense of a good time. And, uh, but when he stood up in the morning from the breakfast table, his face went dead. And mm. I noticed it every day. And then there it was. And I said, oh, I'm not going to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was just right there and then. I'm not going to do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and I went to, I majored in music, idiot that I was. But. <laughs> Idiots that we all are. <laughs> well, my wife and I yesterday had a day off, and we drove to Santa Cruz and went to the beach. And we, we were walking on the beach, and it was beautiful weather outside. And we're thinking to ourselves over and over, and we said this out loud to each other, how lucky are we? No, we don't make a lot of money. Um, and no, we don't get to take a lot of vacations, but almost every job we take is like a vacation. vacation yeah. That's right, you're traveling. We get to see the world. And, and we, were, we were talking with some of uh, her family the, the other day, and they said, do you realize that you, by living in Berlin, ha have done the most exciting thing that this family has ever seen? Yeah. You, you know, and she's like, she said, but, but you're a lawyer. And she's like, I know, but... But you live in Berlin, right? Right. <laughs> and and uh, I mean, we we, I think that keeps us it keeps us uh, grateful, passionate, and grateful yeah. about this job because of the things it gives back to us over and over again, and the things that that we find ourselves slipping into, complaining about. Oh, I have to go to rehearsal today, or oh, um, geez, I have so much music to learn mm -hmm. today. I really wish I could just watch Netflix. <laughs> but would those things get pushed aside so easily when we have moments like? yesterday or moments that mm -hmm. we're going to have in a couple of weeks when I get to sing one of my dream roles on an opera stage. Uh, it's, it's really a great profession. And there were, there were times when I was transferring from, uh, transitioning from young artist to professional when I said, can I do this? Do I really want to do this? And I would stop and think and say, what are my options? Sit at a desk from nine to five? No, thank you. Be careful. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but you said a minute ago that you get to go on breaks and listen to opera. Yes. So I, act, I actually picked this the, this field. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. It didn't pick me. I yeah. picked the field. Yeah. Well, and uh, and I think um, the rewards it gives are far outweigh the the paycheck or whatever other life throws at us. And so I'm very thankful to be doing it. Yeah. I. I've, I've worked for Opera San Jose since I graduated from college. It's my first job out of grad school. And I've been in many positions here over, over the many years. And now suddenly I'm the general director. And it was that first season. I'm in my fourth season now. And in my first season as general director, I was in the theater. And we were doing a world premiere that I really had great belief in. Uh, and I, I just loved it. I, I truly loved it. And there was a moment when one of the characters on stage came down to the apron and it was a summer night in Italy and and there were insects making little noises in the orchestra pit right mm -hmm. and she said look at the stars listen to the night I am perfectly happy and I thought and so am I. I am too. Yes. <laughs> and there have been more than one time that I was kneeling at the orchestra pit talking to the, to the music director and saying, Joe, you and I, we have the best jobs in the world. Yeah. The best jobs in the world. Yeah. yeah. Uh, because it all comes together. Mm -hmm. And that's when, when, when the orchestra arrives. Mm -hmm. That changes everything. And today is the first rehearsal of the principal strings. They have the five principal string yeah. players with the music director. And that's why we're here instead of in my office, because it's too loud in there. Mm -hmm. uh, and then shortly, the whole orchestra, like tomorrow, the whole orchestra will arrive. And they'll work through the score. And then they'll do it again the next day. Mm -hmm. 
and work through the score. That's when I, no matter what I have going on my desk, I need to not have it <laughs> because yes. I will be hiding behind a flat in the rehearsal hall so they can't see me. <laughs> but to hear that, but I have so much more respect for Mozart after I hear the orchestra rehearsals. Mm. Mm. The, and Cozy in particular. Yeah, I love Cozy. Cozy is a, has now become my very favorite Mozart opera, and Aww. I didn't think that would ever happen. Yeah. Uh, but sitting in there and listening to them play, um, it's it's genius. Because mm -hmm. Cozy, I know well enough that I can sing it in my head, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I know what's going on in there sure. while I'm behind my little wall. And the, the just what Mo how Mozart chose to, we're not going to play at all right here. Um, now all of us are going to play over here, and now we'll just have you guys. Mm -hmm. Where he chose to do that in the score, it's brilliant. Mm -hmm. And and you just sit there and you go, my God, he had, you know, compared to Strauss, he had he he, he has no players in the pit, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's hardly anybody there. Mm -hmm. But what he has is doing absolutely the correct thing. Right all the time. Mm -hmm. It's unrelenting. Mm. It's absolutely the right thing all the time. Mm -hmm. And we had to cut, because it's too long. Oh, right? yeah. yeah. Our, it's too long <laughs> for our public. I think everyone agrees. Yeah, it's too long for our public. <laughs> but, and what you do is you take arias out of the second half, yeah. mm -hmm. right? A lot of people get their that second or aria. third mm -hmm. aria. Um, and, and so the doorbell, doesn't, she loses her aria, and everybody loses something. Mm -hmm. But it really wants them. The work really wants those arias because now you have just too many duets in a row. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, for real. So you need the Mozart was not stupid. Mm. We're stupid. <laughs> Our you attention know. spans are, yes. are yeah. severely yes. diminished, and and um, you know I I find that a great opera is a lot like a great movie, and of course a lot of different ways. But in one way is that if the movie is too short, I feel cheated. Mm -hmm. I feel like the story wasn't given time to flesh out. Mm -hmm. And there were things that were taken out of the movie by someone's choice, uh, some editor's choice, that uh, because they didn't think an, a modern audience could sit that long and pay attention. Mm -hmm. And for those of us that actually notice these things, it's really a bad experience. And I find it's the same in opera. I mean... Is Cozy too long? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but when I'm sitting in something that is incredibly uh, through composed and cinematic like Wagner, I don't want to leave early. Mm -hmm. I'm very upset when things are taken out of it because it's like having a, a, you know, a, a string and you cut a, you cut a section out of the middle. Well, it's no longer a complete string. That's right. And so, you see the knot. Mm -hmm. And you can see where it was pieced back together and, you're, yeah. and you miss it. And so uh, that's uh, it's a real problem with today's audiences, and I don't know. You know, it's it's a product of a lot of problems, of course. Um, but uh, I really wish there was a way that we could begin to teach our audiences that if you just give it a chance and give it your full attention for the three hours or the four hours that it calls for, then you're going to walk away with a much greater experience. Then if you sat there for the two and a half hours and you had your two intermissions and you had your cocktails in between and you focused on those things rather than this great, complete, all-encompassing work that is in front of you. Mm -hmm. I agree. Mm -hmm. I've only ever once seen Cozy all the way through. That was at the Met. And I've only ever once seen Figaro all the way through. And that was at L.A. Figaro all the way through is four hours. Mm -hmm. You're two hours in. You get a break, and then you're two hours back out. Mm -hmm. But walking back to the hotel, I thought, that was long, but you have the whole thing. Yeah. And how satisfying was yeah. it? Yeah, absolutely. And you're exhausted because you're satisfied. And and there are not these, like if you cut, the, the normal cuts out of Figaro wreck the timing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Things have to suddenly happen, and the yeah. guy didn't have time to go do what he was supposed to go yeah. do and get back, right? Mm -hmm. and, and it wrecks the timing. So there's this cognitive dissonance that happens mm -hmm. because the story doesn't quite make sense. Mm -hmm. And you do that enough times, and you lose people. Mm -hmm. So anyway, there it is. Well, gosh, we're, we're just way to hell off of 
yeah. target. But we had a good time. Well, I gotta go sing some Zenta. <laughs> yeah, I think I think we're gonna break. So right. thank both of you for thank you. being here. Thank bless you. you, bless you. It was my pleasure. And uh, we're we're gonna have a great time in the theater. And yeah, we are. I'm so looking forward to it all. Great. I'm so excited. Okay. Bye bye. <laughs> bye.